Hello, Year 9 at Wycliffe Mount. I want to say thanks. Thank you for enjoying my interactive story that you've been reading in your form sessions. Thank you to Mr Gaines for sharing it with you. Um, I feel very grateful and privileged, to be honest, that um, you can enjoy something that I've written because I know when I was your age, I was a bit sick of reading all the time because it felt like I would just read all day in school and then the and then the homework and then I feel like the idea of reading for fun which I used to like to do was just just sounded ridiculous why would I read for fun I'm reading all day so thanks for enjoying what I've written I thought today rather than reading anything from the interactive story I'd read from the original book Mythical Creatures of the Forest which is the book I wrote before the interactive one, which tells the story of what happened to Dr. Bernard J. Hoothfellow as he goes into the forest and discovers creatures that people think are only myths. And the book also has stories that stand alone in themselves as short stories. And later in the interactive book, you're going to meet a creature called the Shapeshifter. And I thought the Shapeshifter would be a good story to read here. Because it's written by a character called Blakely Harris, who, in my mind, is roughly your age. So I hope you enjoy it. Oh, and by the way, this might last longer than your form session, so it might have to be split into two videos. Here we go. The Shapeshifter by Blakely Harris. Yes, I said, as I wandered through the trees following after her. Yes, of course I'll follow you. She was trailing something in the air behind her a piece of fabric that she used to tie around her head, and it was flowing in the wind behind her as she walked, and her hair looked even more golden than usual. Come on then, she said, and she kept walking off ahead of me. I didn't realise at the time how foolish I was being, how strung up on her I was, how she might have just been taking me for a fall. We kept walking, and I wasn't allowed to run. She kept checking I didn't speed up, and then she kept walking even more, so that I actually became quite bored by it all, and decided to turn and leave her. And just as I lost interest, she became interested in me. Where are you going? she asked me, as I turned and started to walk off. No, she said, running towards me, bouncily, and she ran in front of me so that I had to stop walking. I was so far away from home now, she had dragged me all this way out for nothing. No, I need to show you something, she said. Her body was very close to mine, and I felt very excited, like I just wanted to grab her and kiss her. But I held back, as if I had restraints all over my body, telling me what might happen if I did what I wanted to do. She will recoil. She won't like it. You'll ruin things, they were saying. I tried to untie them, but they grabbed me even tighter. So I stayed there, immobilised. Come on, she said, walking past me again, with that fabric blowing in my face. Come on, it's not much further, I promise. I wondered if I actually even liked her at all. She was certainly pretty, but I thought that perhaps, if she were not so pretty, I might actively detest her. She always had a selfishness about her, an impatience that I did not like, but because she was so attractive in her looks and the way she walked, I always felt drawn to her, as if I liked her. I imagined her as an ugly girl, with greasy, unclean hair and a lumpy face and a misshapen body. Would I want to be friends with her then? Would I enjoy her company? No, was the answer. We kept walking for about ten more minutes, and I began to wonder if this was just some attention-seeking exercise of hers, to see how long she could keep me being dragged behind her by an imaginary cord. But then she stopped. I caught up to her, and I brushed up against her on purpose, but making it look like an accident, like I hadn't even noticed. She was standing there, looking at the ground. How could someone be made that pretty? I often thought it was ridiculous when I would look at her how pretty she was, how perfectly her eyes were shaped and distanced from each other, how perfect and cute her nose looked, and how full and nicely shaped her mouth was. And her hair was a joke. She looked like she was going to the salon every day to make her hair look thicker and fuller and brighter and shinier and more radiant, but she wasn't. Her mum would cut her hair. I wish now that I hadn't been so transfixed by her. She looked up at me and my heart stopped, but she wasn't actually looking up at me. She was looking behind me. I felt something tap me on the shoulder twice, silently, and I turned around to see a huge tall bear wearing a military uniform, standing above me, over me, so that I had to arch my neck to look up at it. I ran. 
I just bolted. I didn't care for her at all now, and I was running, ducking under branches and being smacked by sun across the face, tripping up on logs and jumping over others. I was getting hit by leaves and slipping and speeding up and falling over, and I could hear this bear behind me, catching up to me. And then there was a bird, flying just beside me, gently flapping its wings occasionally, gliding slowly in the air next to me. I looked around and there was no bear, but she was there, chasing after me, and a small percentage of me enjoyed her chasing after me for once. I was growing tired, and I slowed down now that I was safe, and whilst panting and slightly wheezing, with a pain in my chest and a metallic taste in my mouth, I slowed down to a walk, and this bird landed in front of me and began to walk with me. This is what I wanted to show you, she said, catching up with me and pointing at the bird. This is my friend, Dozel. Dozel, why did you have to scare him like that? Be normal, please. The bird chirped, and before me I saw it grow and swell and change colour and change shape until it was a hunched over shape of a human, dressed in normal clothes, standing up to face me, and looked down on me slightly. Now he was a very handsome young man, around my age but slightly older, and as he went to shake my hand a portion of his long hair fell in front of his eye, and he shook it away with his head. Pleased to meet you, he said. My name's Dozel. Sorry to scare you. I thought it might just be a funny joke, you know? I shook his hand, and his handshake was too firm for my liking, like he was trying to squeeze my hand too hard to show that he was stronger than me. And he was. My hand folded in his like it was paper. Have you ever seen anything like this? She said to me, walking up to this guy and putting her arms around him, hugging him from the side so her head rested in his broad chest. No, I said. I was annoyed cheated. She was with this guy. This thing. Was he really a guy? What on earth was he? What on earth are you? I asked. Blakely, don't be so rude. Dozel is sensitive about things like that. Dozer was looking at me, dead in the eye, smiling slightly. His chin was too high, like he was trying to look down on me even more. I'm a shapeshifter, this guy said. I can form any shape. But are you human? I asked him. What is your original form? He stopped his usual flow of speaking, as if he was interrupted by something inside of him. After slightly shuffling his feet so that his head wobbled, he said, Yes, this is my original form. I'm human, but I can shapeshift. I don't believe you, I said. He's not human, Clara, I said, pointing at him, at his face, his pretty face. She looked up at him lovingly and said, Yes, of course he is. She was smiling, almost laughing like I was being stupid, and he bent down and kissed her on the lips. So that was it then, was it? I said. This is what you wanted to show me. Yes, she said. I walked past them both on my way back home. It would take me at least an hour to get back now. What a fool I was. He's not who you think he is, I said, walking away, and then looking behind me to check he had not morphed into a tiger or something. No, Blakely, she said, running after me again. I was so foolish. Her breaking away from him and running after me actually gave me a kind of pride. I think I must have been addicted to approval, or desperate for attention, or love or something. No, she came up to me and put her hand on my shoulder. There is one more thing, she said. What? I asked. She had hypnotic eyes, eyes that made you throw logic and reason and common sense out of the window, because something about her attention resting on you made you feel good about yourself. Yes, well, she said, looking back at Dozer, or whatever his name was. Well, I just need you to do a favour for me, she said. What? There was a pause, and she looked bashfully at the ground. Kiss me, she said. What? Kiss me. I took a step back. I would have, had she not just kissed that weird guy who was now watching us from a distance. Just kiss me, once, on the lips, that is all. She stepped in towards me, looking at me intensely, but my heart wrenched itself away from her. Why? I said. Because, she said, because if I receive a kiss from someone who likes me, if it is done in the presence of Dozil, I will be able to become a shapeshifter just like him. What? I said again. Rubbish. He's fooling you, you know. Then as I was looking at him, standing there, still, looking smug, she stepped into me again as she grabbed my neck and kissed me firmly and softly and intensely, so that I felt my whole body turn into electricity and light, and then she broke away with a clean, crisp noise of a kiss from her lips, and I felt like I had been used. Okay, she said, looking at the shapeshifter. Now what? He started walking towards us, and then for no reason at all, he stooped down low and turned into a lizard, crawling, biting at a fly that was in the air, buzzing around and he caught it and ate it. Then he stood up again into the same human being, and he put his arm around her. Now you have his power, he said. I was standing there, feeling quite helpless, and all of a sudden weak, tired, like I didn't want to go anywhere. 
You must learn to shapeshift before the power goes back home, so sit down, he said. She sat down obediently. I thought her first trick might be to turn into a dog. Now, imagine an animal, he said, whichever one you want. An eagle, she said excitedly. It was like I wasn't even there anymore. They were both ignoring me. My job was done. Now hold the vision and bring it towards you, so that it replaces your body, so that you are now living inside this eagle, so that you are the eagle, and you can feel what it is like to have a beak and wings and super sharp eyes and talons and whatever else an eagle feels like. I felt all the power drain out of my legs, like there was a hose that was siphoning off the blood, and I fell to the floor feeling exhausted. And then as I was lying there I saw her change into an eagle, a beautiful one, an annoyingly beautiful one. I was mesmerised. And then he did an awful thing. He pulled out a pair of handcuffs from his pocket, and he quickly grabbed her by the leg and tightened one of the cuffs around it, so that it became small and tight, and she was trapped and she could not get away. She was flapping her wings and squawking, but he was holding onto the other cuff, holding it with his hand tightly so that she could not get away. She started pecking at him, but it seemed to make no difference, and he suddenly vanished, so that he was formless or invisible, and he was walking off into the woods further away from me, dragging this majestic and squawking eagle, and they disappeared off together into the forest. I remember not really caring about any of this as I saw her being dragged away. Serves you right, I thought, as I felt my eyes drooping closed, and for an hour or so, the world did not exist for me. When I woke up, I had enough energy to stand. Perhaps I should have gone looking for her then, but I didn't. I was angry that I'd been used like that, drained like that, and I wanted her to get what she deserved. But the whole journey home I was haunted by the image of her squawking, realising she had been tricked, feeling so confused as to why he was doing it and wishing she never had. I was the only one who knew about it. If I didn't do anything, he would have her forever. What did he plan to do with her? Was she stuck like that now? I didn't know, but when I was nearly home I saw my friend Ronnie walking nearby, carrying a stick with him. He was playing with the stick, swinging it around in the air and doing all sorts of fancy and twirly tricks with it. All right, Blakely, he said as he saw me coming his way. I felt I had to tell him. The words just started pouring out of me. Ronnie, you won't believe me, but you remember you saw me and Clara going into the forest earlier today? Oh yeah, you absolute lad. What happened then? Or is that a private matter? He was half paying attention to me, but still half paying attention to the stick he had found in the woods. She's been taken by someone. What? he said. He stopped twirling his stick around. He stopped and let it rest on the ground, and he looked at me. What happened? he said. I was trying to find the words to describe it to him, but then I stopped trying, and I said, We need to go and get her back right now. Come on. My energy was returning now, and we started to run together. Ronnie was fitter than I was. He did all sorts of sports and martial arts, so for him, it was just like walking. Who's taken her? How? he was asking. You won't believe me, I was saying. Just tell me or I'm going to think you're having me on. A big guy, a young guy, I said, but he could do things. He had, like, these superpowers where he could change shape. Ronnie stopped running. What, you mean like a shapeshifter? Ronnie said. I stopped as well, not sure what he was thinking. Yes, I said exactly like that. He said he was a shapeshifter. Have you heard of them? Ronnie started running again. If you're joking, I'm not going to speak to you ever again. Are you serious? He said. Yes, I said. Honestly, I swear it's true. Oh, no, he said, ducking under a branch. I've read about them. I've got this book at home and it talks about shapeshifters. Some of the nicest people you could meet and others are really horrible, just like humans. But they are not actually humans. Their normal shape is a slow greeny blue blob with arms and legs, a bit like a big slug. And they drift so slowly and so lazily that they developed a way to change shape so they could move around easier. But they can develop all sorts of weird habits, like collecting things or... Collecting things, I said. I had images of a whole room full of animals that this shapeshifter had collected for himself. All humans that he had managed to turn into pets. Yeah, Ronnie said, see, they need human energy to survive. They can't live without it. So often they will collect people and keep them stored away so that they can access people's energy when they get tired. Well, that must be what he took her for. He made her turn into an eagle first and then dragged her off into the distance. So you don't know where they are? No, I said, no, not really. I felt at a loss, but we were both still running further and further and further, just to get to where I'd last seen them. I was exhausted again, but I was not so aware of it. I knew we had to help her, even though I didn't like her. Here, here is where they walked off, I said, pointing at the ground and following the direction they took. And then I couldn't see them any more after this point, I said, 
reaching a large tree that they had disappeared behind. Shh, Ronnie said. He might be listening. He won't be far from here, I bet. They are lazy shapeshifters. They never travel far if they don't have to. If you met him around here, I bet he lives very close. I looked around. Where? I mouthed at Ronnie silently, raising my arms and hands up by my sides. He lifted his finger and he pointed at the large tree next to me. There, he mouthed back silently, pointing at the base of the trunk. He slowly walked up to the tree and he started rubbing his hands around the bottom of the trunk like he was looking for something. His hand disappeared into the leaves that were coating the floor and he suddenly looked up at me. Yes, he said very quietly, and suddenly the base of the tree opened up, slowly and grandly, eerily revealing a dark and narrow staircase that was shining in darkness, leading down further and further into the ground. Come on, Ronnie said. He was fearless, almost excited to get going, but I was afraid. I held back. I watched him walking down the stairs slowly, and his feet were making squelching noises as he took each step. I saw the tree trunk door beginning to close again, and I couldn't leave him alone, so I ran inside as it was closing, and it closed behind me, leaving us in darkness, other than a faint outline of steps and a sticky, gooey floor that felt like it was trying to pull off my shoes every time I moved my feet. I walked down a few steps, and he was waiting for me. I felt the warmth of Ronnie's body standing there and he brought his mouth to my ear to whisper. That's his entrails, all that sticky stuff, he slides down the steps like it's just a slope. But then as he said that I slipped, the stairs all gave way so they turned smooth, just like a slope, and we both fell and hit the gooey surface hard and I remember my backbone bend on impact. And we both started sliding down this slope, going around corners and we were going faster and faster. I was holding on to Ronnie and he was holding on to me. And as we were going even faster, we saw an opening, a light at the bottom, and we both flew out into the light onto the hard, stony floor, scraping our clothes and our skins as we slid. I could hear animals, noises of birds and monkeys and insects, and I looked up to see a wall of cages, and then another wall, and then another wall, all covered in cages with animals in. There were birds, dogs, cats, monkeys, and in the distance, I was sure I could also see a human. We were both looking around, and although it was still dark, we could see lots of things, and I was sure that I could actually see a human in the distance standing in a cage, naked, with its hands on the bars, looking at us. We walked past squawks and screams and howls of the other creatures, and I saw that we came to a beautiful eagle, and I was sure it was Clara. She flapped her wings and tossed her head and squawked as we approached, and I walked past her and went to the human. It was a woman, and she looked dirty, unwashed and unhappy. We are not shapeshifters, I said. We have come to free you. Where are the keys? Where's the shapeshifter? She was looking at us unsurely. She was looking at Ronnie like she didn't trust him. She looked like an animal, a caged animal. He's not here, she said. He is gone. Please, only a real shapeshifter can open the cages. There are no keys, I... Ronnie walked past me and he pulled open the cage door. She stood there and did not move. Come on, Ronnie said, beckoning her out. Everyone, let's go. Ronnie started running around the place, unlocking cage after cage after cage. And then to my absolute bewilderment, he quickly shrank down and morphed and turned into a large brown bird, flying and swooping around the place, touching cage doors with his wings, and they were opening, and all of the animals were flooding out of their prisons, free, and we all began to run towards the exit. But as we did, we saw the tall figure of a huge blue slug that was standing at the door. The slug had a face, with a mouth and eyes, and it immediately shifted to take the shape of a polar bear, one so big that the exit became the size of its leg, and it let out an almighty roar that shook through my bones. Release them, Dozel, Ronnie said, forming himself into a human again. Oh, Ronnie, Dozel said, beginning to laugh quite a deep, gruesome laugh to himself. I thought that we would never see each other again. Let them go and turn them back, Ronnie said, beginning to groan and swell up as he stood there. No, they are my life. I will not survive without their energy, their turmoil, their stress. You can, there are other ways. You can live off love, off light not the turmoil of human energy. Those all laughed again, and his white, furry body wobbled. No, he said no. This is the way. Confuse them and cage them, and put them in forms that they do not really want to take, so they feel even worse about themselves. Foolish, trapped, lost and forever forgotten, and alienated from who they are. That is how to farm energy, so it is right for absorption. Let them go, Ronnie said. His whole body was turning black and hairy, and he was turning into a giant gorilla, the same size as the polar bear, and Ronnie was beginning to stamp his feet and beat his fists into his chest, which made bumping noises inside my whole body. 
No, the polar bear shouted, and he flew at Ronnie, going right for his neck with bare, huge fangs, and Ronnie grabbed Dozel by the head and rolled and threw him over the top of him, kicking the bear away with his big feet so that the bear crashed into the wall, and bits of stone from the wall were falling from the ceiling down on top of him. The polar bear charged again, slightly clumsily, and Ronnie grabbed it again and threw it again and now jumped on top of it and started hammering his fists down onto the polar bear, who was slashing back at Ronnie with its claws, but eating punches at the same time. Ronnie was getting his face slashed as well, but then that beautiful eagle, Clara, swooped in and began tearing at the polar bear's eyes with her talons, and soon all the other animals were in on top of the bear, slashing and biting and burrowing into him. Even little insects were flying in and burrowing into the polar bear's fur, and I was just watching it all happen, edging away from all the chaos, without even realising I was moving. And soon it all died down, all the commotion, all the terror, and the polar bear was left there, bloodied and red, with the animals and the giant gorilla piling off it and standing back to their own feet. The polar bear started turning blue, getting smaller and more slimy, until Dozer was back in his original form, and as he did, the others began to shift as well. Back to humans, naked humans standing there, liberated but now embarrassed that they were naked, and Clara came running up to me and hugged me. Thank you, I'm so sorry, she said, and she kissed me again on the lips. When we were walking home through the woods towards our village, Ronnie had not said anything at all. He was in the shape of Ronnie again, my friend that I thought I had known for years. He was looking at the floor, and his face was much dirtier than before. She was walking slightly behind us. Well, I said, won't you say anything about all of this, who you really are? I don't know what to say, Ronnie said. I'm sorry I couldn't tell you before, but you would have never believed me. And if I showed you, then you might have stopped being friends with me. I really ever shapeshift these days, since I'm quite happy as I am. Oh, I think it's wonderful, she said behind us. Oh, just shut up, will you, I said to her. She went deathly silent. I felt bad. So what about your parents? Are they shapeshifters too, I said. My dad is. My mum isn't. Does your mum know? No. Well, what if we tell her? She giggled behind us. Her silence had not lasted. No one will believe you, Ronnie said back to her. And it was true. I'd much rather you just didn't say anything. It would make things much easier for me and my family, and it could be as a thank you for coming with Blakely to save you. Of course I wasn't going to say anything, she said, looking at her feet, sounding slightly embarrassed. I was only joking. OK, I said, turning to them. So we never say anything, ever again. We never speak about it again, even if we are alone, just in case someone hears. I put my hand in the middle of us to form a bond. She put her hand on top of mine, and Ronnie put his hand on top of hers. Promise, we all said. I walked the rest of the way home, knowing in my mind that she was going to tell. And at the end of this story we have a note from Dr Bernard J. Hoofalo. And his note reads, I can never tell who is a shapeshifter and who isn't. I have never met one honest enough to tell me about their past and still believe them. In my experience, they are liars, often deceitful and rather spiteful, and they have taught me the importance of never judging things merely by how they look on the surface. They seem to feed off the energy of human suffering. It keeps them alive and well, and have been known to kidnap people in order to survive. I have been told that there are some who do good, some shapeshifters that have learnt other ways to take in their energy that does not involve human suffering. I am yet to meet one. Perhaps they do not live in the forest. And that's the end of that chapter. So thank you for watching, everyone. I hope you enjoyed it. Maybe I'll do another one of these videos for you sometime, depending on how much you liked it or not. And that's it. Maybe speak to you again another time. Bye-bye.